Howdy folks, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am your host, the Mighty Bjorn, and today for you, I have a Skies of Ace Combat video. Got something quite a bit special here today, as of all the planes I'm going to present in the series of Skies of Ace Combat, this is probably the absolutely most famous one of them. Sure, you can give some fame, credit of fame to planes like the F-4 Phantom for its service in Vietnam, as well as the F-16 for its appearances in the movie Blue Thunder, as well as the Iron Eagle series. But I think really the most iconic of probably all the planes, of course there's also the A-10, but I still I want to argue that it's the F-14 Tomcat. So let's talk about the F-14 Tomcat, the history and its development. And let's start off with the Grumman F-14 Tomcat was actually named after Admiral Thomas Tomcat. Connolly. He was actually the one most lobbying the most for the, the development of the F-14 Tomcat. The F-14 is an American carrier based two seat twin engine all weather capable fighter of a variable sweep wing design. It is also a tandem seat design. It was actually the first series of fighters in the teen series which would also include the F-15 the F-16, and the F-18. This is essentially the first of the fourth generation fighters in U.S. military service. The F-14 first flew December 21st, 1970, but it wouldn't actually enter service until September 22nd, 1974. Originally, it was intended for the F-111B to actually be the carrier plane of choice. However, the plane had quite a bit of performance issues, especially with carrier-based style landings, stability issues at flying at slower speeds, although I saw some about stability issues at higher speeds as well. And it was also a very heavy plane. Now that being said, the reason I pointed out that this is a tandem seat design where essentially you have the, the pilot and the radio operator directly, the sorry, the radar intercept officer directly behind the pilot with the F-111B. It is side-by-side -side seating, sort of like the A-6. And of course, during the testing for the F-111B, they would find out these various performance issues and actually even suffer some crashes. So that kind of became a bit of a problem and the F-111 would be canceled. Now that was in naval service the f-111 would actually go on serve with the air force because actually it's originally was designed to be an air force plane and it was going through the process to be redesigned to be a naval plane without all that being said though the navy still needed a plane they wanted a high speed pure fighter interceptor type air superiority fighter and they they had nothing so it was decided that they would begin designing and things of that nature, trial stages, with the F-14 Tomcat, which was done by Grumman. The fighter would feature two Pratt & Whitney TF-30 engines. Now these engines were originally designed actually for the F-111B, and honestly, it would actually later cause some problems with the F-14A, which I'll dive into here a little bit later. But it did cause some problems with the early F-14s. The early F-14A would also feature an AWG-9 radar system. And this would allow the F-14 to track up to 26 targets at one time, which was actually really good for its time. It's actually still fairly good when you look at the various radar systems that the various countries are using in their planes. Now, some of the radar systems that you're getting in the current fifth generation planes is actually better per se, but for its time, it's definitely, honestly, the radar system, the, the controls, the avionics, and even the use of the AIM 54 Phoenix missiles really made this plane ahead of its time. And also with that being said, because of that AWG-9 radar, B-52 
being teamed up with the AIM-54 Phoenix missiles, it would allow the F-14 to engage targets over 100 miles away, which was actually very incredible for its time. It's actually still pretty good even to compare to today's standards. Now, there is some missiles that are starting to approach the Phoenix missiles range, but there's still not, it's not like there's a whole lot of them out there. The F-14 Tomcat would also feature an M61A1 Vulcan cannon for close range engagements. The F-14 would also undergo a series of upgrades over its lifetime. The most noticeable was actually the replacement of the TF-30 engine with the General Electric F-110 GE-400 engines. And I want to make a note of the color change, how you can tell the difference. Because see, the thing to understand is that the F-14 Tomcat in service, when it went over, especially the engine upgrades, uh, not all the F-14As would actually be upgraded with the new engines. So you'd have F-14As in service alongside F-14Bs as well as F-14Ds. Now the thing, the, the primary thing with the F-14B, at first, these were planes that were upgraded with the new engines. And the main way to tell between the two planes was is there was a different uh, thrust nozzle color. Uh, the F-14A was more of a black color, while the F-14B and D, with its general electric engines, actually had a more of a silver color, metallic color, if you will. And that was like the one way to tell the difference between an F-14A and the other F-14s in this series. Now, the process of upgrading the F-14As would begin in 1984, and at first they were called F-14A+. However, they were re later redesignated to F-14B as of May of 1991. Now during that time frame, Grumman would also design another plane, more or less another upgraded version of the F-14 Tomcat, which was the F-14D. Now there's quite a few design changes on this plane. The most notable ones that I want to go over obviously is the F-110 GE 400 turbofan engines. The F-14 did, the F-14D had those engines as well as it also had a redesigned glass canopy, which was also an issue with the earlier F-14s. I'll save that for the end as well. And then new digital flight control systems were also installed. Understand that the plane was a hybrid system digital electric, or sorry, um, analog electric. So it was, it was kind of a fly-by-wire, but not fully fly-by-wire. The F-14D would be a complete fly-by-wire plane. While the F-14 was lightweight compared to the F-111B, it was still a fairly heavy plane, and it was a very expensive plane for its time. Probably literally one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive. At least in the realm of fighters. This would lead to also to the design and the development of the F-18, which would replace both F-4s and A-7s that were in service at the time with the United States Marine Corps and the United States Navy. In 1991, the pending replacement of the A-6 Intruder, the F-14 would be put through a program. It was called the F-14 Air to Ground Program. The goal of this program was to give the F-14 essentially fighter-bomber capabilities. However, at first, the F-14 did prove insufficient, and after some trial and error, they would figure out how to get it to the point where this plane could actually use basically dumb drop bombs, like Mark 84s. However, improvements would be made to the F-14s, by adding the Lantern Targeting Pod system, which would allow the F-14 to actually designate targets 
for laser guided GBUs and other types of guided munitions. There's also retroactive retro changes made to the avionics and controls of the F-14. And over time, it would actually be, it would prove to be, actually be a very capable fighter bomber, actually. Uh, and its role was kind of starting to get to the point where it's kind of crossing the line between like, sort of kind of like the F-15E. It wasn't as capable yet as the F-15E, but it was actually getting to be pretty capable plane. However, with all that being said, between lobbying, cost per unit, and the cost of the upgrades, the writing was on the wall for the F-14. In 1994, the Super Tomcat 21 was proposed to Congress by Grumman, but the upgrade program was shot down, while the ST-21 would have given the F-14 the same capabilities, if not superior capabilities, to the F-15 Strike Eagle, it was believed that the F-A-18 would prove to be even more capable than the F-14. Now, kind of what it comes down to is the reason this is the case is because the F-14 is was designed completely around the idea of being a fighter, a high-speed interceptor particularly to shoot down bombers and other long-range planes. However, that never came to fruition. That is all related to the Cold War. And with that being said, too, the F-14 was actually, or sorry, the F-18 was designed to actually be a multi-role type plane. It was also a much cheaper plane over the F-14. So, yeah, unfortunately, even though the F-14 would actually prove to be pretty good in all regards, the F-18 just foreshadowed it because government. With that being said, it would continue to serve with the United States Navy until 2006, but Iran continues to use the F-14 Tomcat. A total of 712 F-14s have been produced over its years, but it is no longer being produced as well as there's no longer any parts being produced for these planes. Now, I'm a little foggy on how Iran got the F-14 Tomcats that they do have, but from what I understand, and this is one thing I think that's kind of funny about, well, they're too expensive to have around, is these planes, even when they went out of service, were still considered very capable planes. And the United States government did not want to risk any F-14 Tomcats falling into enemy hands. So if I understand the information correctly, the literature, it seems that the F-14s that were left over when the F-14 was finally removed from service were scrapped. They didn't keep them around. They didn't sell them to any foreign countries because it was decided that the plane could be too much of a threat to American fighter aircraft. Yeah, what a meme that is. I mean, that's, that just goes to show the total failure of the government of, oh, well, these planes are too expensive, but... And, and the, the F-18 is more capable, but, um, yeah, we can't let these fall in enemy hands. We can't risk it. So instead of selling those planes off to a foreign ally, it was decided to scrap the planes. Now, there still is F-14s that were in United States military service in museums. Those planes are obviously protected. With that being said, though, the Iranian planes, like I said, no more parts being made for these planes. No more of these planes are being produced. So essentially, there's kind of a shelf life on the Iranian F-14s because, you know, they, they don't have parts. They have no way of getting parts. Planes break down, obviously. Things of that nature. Now, there's a couple things I want to cover when it comes to the design flaws of the F-14. The first one I want to cover is actually compression stalls with the TF-30 engines. That was actually shown in Top Gun and that was actually a legit thing. Uh, it was shown in, in the 19, what, 1984 movie Top Gun, or maybe it was 82. 
I can't remember when the original Top Gun came out. Forgive me, I'm old and shit. But that was actually a legit problem with the F-14 Tomcats where it had something to do with airflow. The engine essentially would choke itself out. And going by actual naval trained pilots, pretty much whenever that happens, you're pretty well screwed. It's really hard to get those engines to restart once they stall out. So that was kind of an issue with the early F-14s. And what that actually has to do with is it actually has to do with the air duct work of the F-14. So you understand that the TF-30 engine was not designed for the F-13, F-14. It was actually designed for the F-111. However, they decided to, so they could get these planes into service, they would use those TF-30 engines. And instead of redesigning the engine to essentially work for the F-14, they kind of just crammed them in there, and the air duct work really wasn't, per se, enough and wasn't designed properly for the TF-30 engine. The next thing I also want to cover, and this was another thing that happened in Top Gun, is with the F-14As, and I also believe the Bs, although later models of the Bs might have got the glass canopy, the early planes did not have a glass canopy that was breakable. I, actually, I'm not even sure if they were glass at all, but the canopy was not breakable. Essentially, you'd pull the ejection handle, the canopy would jettison. Shortly after, the uh, radio intercept officer would jettison, would eject, and then the pilot would eject shortly afterwards. And all this would happen within about 0.85 seconds. It was actually a pretty quick process. The problem is, is due to speed and other different natures, speed, design, air drag, etc. The canopy would actually get stuck at times. And the Navy actually would lose some pilots. And actually they did show that in Top Gun. That was actually inspired by a real event that happened. The, the scene I'm talking about is where Goose dies because his head and neck smashed off the canopy because the canopy did not properly separate. Now later that would be handled by retrofitting a canopy discarding handle in the plane. So essentially the role was is you pulled that handle first, the canopy would discard, would jettison, and once it if it once it properly jettisoned, then the the radio intercept officer could pull the ejection seat handles the eject the radio intercept officer would eject and then the pilot would eject now with the f-15ds and the glass canopy those don't e those uh canopies don't jettison the seat is designed to actually smash through the canopy now that is actually pretty standard for most planes actually the a6 was designed that way I believe the F-15 is. The F-16, I also believe, is designed that way. Not 100% sure about the F-18, though. Uh, and I'm not sure about newer planes like the F-35 and the F-22. I really didn't extensively research it, but I did find it interesting that the, essentially they went from a non-breakable canopy to a breakable canopy for safety reasons. That being said, this was actually a really advanced plane for its time. Probably the most advanced plane, but that would also indubitably, I, I want to say indubitably, I, I'm, that might be the wrong word, but it would end up actually costing the F-14 down the road. Primarily because of two things. One, it's just so damn, it was so damn expensive. It was expensive just to do the upgrades and the retrofits to get this plane to do other things that it wasn't really designed to do, even though it did do a pretty good job at those roles when it would receive those retrofits. But yeah, at the end of the day, it was just too specialized of a plane to really keep around in the, the opinions of Congress. With that being said, though, when this thing got pulled from the service, it was still really ahead of its game because even the AIM-120 missiles did not, at the time, have the range that the Phoenix missiles had. Now, the newest versions of the AIM-120s actually does have that range as well as the newer F-8 
FA-18 radar and the other radar systems throughout the other planes also has radar systems that boast that great range of being able to engage the targets over 100 miles away. Either ways, I really like this plane, and if you want to see some media that features this plane, obviously Top Gun. Top Gun's the big one, and then you can also check out Top Gun Maverick, which also has an F8, uh, F-14A in it. Even though the F-18s are the star of the show, the F-14 still steals the show for me. I, I really like this plane. I think it's a rather cool plane. And, yeah, so there you go. That's my history development presentation of the F-14 Tomcat. Hopefully you all enjoy it. Don't forget to like the video and comment down below. What do you think about the F-14 Tomcat and its history within the United States military? Anyway, folks, once again, thank you very much for watching and have yourself a wonderful day.